Welcome to worship this morning with the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. It's good to be here with you, each of you here in person in this space, and all of you at home joining us on Zoom. Welcome. I invite you to read responsively with me our call to worship. I will read all of the lines. If you will join me, please, in the dark print. A word of encouragement came from prophet to people. Live a life that is full. Build, plant, eat, love, multiply. Pray for your communities. Keep God in the center of all that is. We enter into worship today with hope in our hearts for something happens here that reminds us that we can live as God desires. God has made a promise of faithfulness to us and we can trust the promise. The invocation this morning is from the Third Millennium Ministries. Will you pray with me? We pray justice for the falsely accused, freedom for the wrongly imprisoned, healing for the tortured or abused, care for the orphan and widow, concern for the refugee and dispossessed, and above all, forgiveness for our emotional detachment. May we weep as you weep, love as you love, and not be afraid to be angry for the sake of your children wherever they might be. In our helplessness we ask, Lord, enfold them in your love. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, chapter 4, verses 18, uh, verses 13 through 25. And it's found on the Pew Bible on page 916. Um, Paul, being quite a scholar, a lot of his letters is just are very dense. They seem to be full of, full of legalese, and it's difficult to unpack what the sense is. And so I'm going to be reading from... Um, Mr. Dr. Peterson's The Message, which is in a contemporary or contemporary language. That famous promise God gave Abraham that he and his children would possess the earth was not given because of something Abraham did or would do. 
It was based on God's decision to put everything together for him, which Abraham then entered when he believed. If those who get what God gives them only to get it by doing everything they are told to do, filling out all the right forms properly signed that eliminate personal trust completely, that's a business deal. A contract drawn up by a hard-nosed lawyer and with plenty of fine print only makes sure you will never be able to collect. But if there is no contract in the first place, simply a promise, and God's promise at that, you can't break it. This is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God and His way and then simply embracing Him and what He does. God's promise arrives as pure guilt, pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it, those who keep the religious traditions and those who'd never heard of them. For Abraham is father of us all. He's not our racial father. That's reading the story backward. He is our faith father. We call Abraham father not because he got God's attention by being like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in the scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father. A father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do, raise the dead to life. With a word that made something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anywhere, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, you're going to have a family, a big family, Abraham. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say, it's hopeless. This hundred year old body could never father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. That's why it said Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. But it's not just Abraham, it's also us. The same thing gets said about us when we embrace and believe the one who brought Jesus to life when the conditions were equally hopeless. The sacrifice Jesus made us fit for God, set us right with God. All of our scripture readings this morning talk about taking a, a trip to a new land, whether it is God inviting people to go or the Israelites finding themselves far from home. And then what happens when you make that journey? How do you make home? How do you find God? How do you understand your life? So with this theme in mind, I invite you to stand with me if you are able and um, if you wish, and let's pray together our prayer of confession and affirmation. God beyond borders, we confess that we often do not notice the exiles around us. We tolerate a culture that suspects all who are different from us. We admit how easy it is for us to opt for comfort and easy choices. We confess we have often fallen silent in the presence of those who speak words of anger and hate. Have mercy on us, O oh God, for surely you take the side of justice. Send us friends out of places we least expect that our creation might be enriched. Call us to be generous with our blessings. Open our hearts to all the wonders you perform. In love and compassion, Will you extend a word or sign of peace to your neighbor?
I have swapped our third and second readings. The second fits well with the first we just heard from Pamela Ellers. So our second reading comes from Genesis chapter 12, the first nine verses. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, note that, And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev.
Each of our texts this morning and in their own ways invite us to be in this present moment, trusting that somehow by showing up fully where we are, body, mind, and spirit, we are connecting with the creative work of God. That by being present here in this place and in this moment, we are trusting that God is taking care of all of the rest, nurturing and restoring all things. Will our ushers come forward as we prepare ourselves for a time of giving? Our gifts today in worship are an act of that trust, believing whatever small amounts we contribute of our time, our energy, our passions, our resources today and this moment, God will take them and do more with them than we could ever ask or imagine. Let us give. Let's enter into a time of prayer together, holding a little bit of silence, and then I'll bring us into a spoken prayer. Oh God, we aren't so sure what you mean when you say you'll call us. We hear the story of Abram at 75 being told to pack up his life, move to a new land, trust that you are somehow at work, believe he would be the father of a new nation. And not only do we listen with disbelief, we hope that kind of nonsense won't happen to us. We're tired. We're rooted already. Our lives are full. We aren't so sure we want for you to call us if calling asks so much. Help us to listen to this story, not just as an individual. Help us to hear these ancient stories as a collective. That somehow, in that old, old story, you were dreaming of us too that our lives aren't just linked to the ones here in this room, but the ones across time who have said yes to your wild ideas and even wilder spirit. 
Help us to believe that you are moving and swirling and creating far beyond the pages of this old book into the nooks and crannies of our world. Help us to believe that you are making all things new, that you are still plotting goodness, that you see and hear and notice us, that you have not vanished, that you are near to us as breath. And maybe, just maybe, we might be bold enough together to live out all of these ways that that old book describes. With the steps of Christ before us, the Spirit's breath within us, and the love of God around us, may we be bold to live just as we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When I realized this text from Jeremiah had cycled around in the lectionary again, I thought I'd fold it into the middle of the service as a second reading and let it be quietly meaningful to me. It's one of my favorites. But I changed my mind and decided to bring it into the light of the third reading and share a little bit about why this text holds such significance in my heart. This is the text I used for my first sermon here at St. Charles when I preached in view of a call, as we Baptists say, on September 15th, 2013. This was the day the congregation would vote on whether or not to hire me or call me to be your pastor. And as I remember it, Linda Easterling was a bit nervous about the way that vote might go, but I believe it was unanimous that day. The Jeremiah text and the Genesis text together speak of times when God and people are on the move. With Abram, it is the word to go. Go to the land where I am sending you. At 75 years old, as some of you can imagine, he and his wife Sarai are told they will give birth to an entire nation. And that sounds exhausting. 
Go from this place, your home, to a new land, and I'll show you, but you don't know about it yet, and you can't see it. And I'll bless you in ways that you cannot imagine. But in Jeremiah, the going has already happened, and it wasn't by the promise of blessing from God. Israel is in exile. Israel is already far from home, and the word of God reaches them all the way there in the faraway place of Babylon. Our third reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your own. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to your dreams that you dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and I will fulfill my promise to you and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, plans to give you a future with hope. On September 15th, 2013, I called this sermon Home Not So Sweet Home and shared it with the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church on my first time in this pulpit. I offer it today only slightly amended with very minor commentary along the way. On the next to last Sunday of August 2003, my husband Nathan and I, 25 and 26 years old at the time, with the help of supportive family and friends, loaded a questionable U-Haul truck with all of our worldly possessions and a Saturn view <laughs> which was totaled soon thereafter, with two swank, <laughs> slightly tranquilized cats and a basset hound named Lucille. We began the slow crawl from Birmingham, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia, made slower by said questionable U-Haul that died twice along the way. During our second unexpected delay, the one where we spent two nights in a hotel, a mechanic in Greensboro, North Carolina asked us, has anyone ever told you that this truck has been on fire before? And the answer was no, they had not. They had withheld that important piece of information. We began at that point to add up the number of seminaries and divinity schools between Birmingham and Richmond, Beeson, McAfee, Candler, Columbia, Wake Forest, Duke, Wondering if our sense of call to Virginia was mistaken. Had we overlooked an easier, more convenient way to pursue my theological education? But we shrugged that wondering off because this was an adventure and we were much younger and we had been called. Nathan and I, just two years into our marriage, were endlessly patient, as I recall 20 years later with that journey. We finally arrived in Richmond many days later than expected to set up our temporary home with the full expectation on my part that we would stay no longer than my three-year MDiv required. It was practically an extended vacation and I was certain we'd go right back to Birmingham. Well, that degree stretched into four years of coursework and another and final stint as a youth minister, the birth of our first child, a waiting year before completing the required mission immersion travel experience, then graduation, then the birth of our second child, joining another congregation to love and serve, 
And just like that, a full decade passed. Ten years blinked by. And Richmond became the home that I did not want to make home. Woo, y'all. A friend and pastoral counselor in Birmingham from our church there took me to lunch back in August 2003 before we made the trek, knowing that Nathan and I were preparing for the move and aware of my not-so-secret plans to return both to that city and that exact congregation in just three short years' time, she gently and wisely said to me, go to Richmond and let it be your community. Let it be your home. So for 10 years, I struggled with that advice, but I never forgot her words. I sought to listen to her and to live that way. I sought to be at peace, to allow myself to learn from the present and to accept that beautiful place as home. But for most of my 10 years in the historic city of Richmond with its numerous Civil War monuments, pre take them down busy tattoo parlors and abundant farmers markets, its lively James River coursing through the center of town, stately historic homes and dear, dear friends who loved us so well. Staying put became a life practice. What that friend in Birmingham knew, and I suspected I would learn the hard way, was that we cannot be fully present and real time when we're always looking over our shoulder to go back to another place, another time, another life. Jeremiah gave similar instruction as he wrote to the exiles, build houses and make yourselves at home. Plant gardens, eat what grows in that country. Marry and have children, encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves home there and work for the city's welfare. Well, I cannot and do not draw too strong a parallel between my move from the deep south to the mid-Atlantic and Israel's exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I found myself living inside these words from Jeremiah for quite some time as the prophet's guidance settles still deep into my bones. Make home in the place where God has sent you. Even today, 2023, trusting the present moment can feel like a struggle for me. Ever aware of both what has been and what might be to come, I need practices that root me to earth and time, here and now. We know that one of the struggles of exile for Israel was that they believed God's presence on earth was limited to the structures within the temple in Jerusalem. If the temple had been destroyed and God's children had been carried off to a foreign land, the logic followed that God was no longer with them. You see, if God dwelled in the temple and the temple dwelled in Jerusalem and now the temple is no more and these folks are far from home, they reasoned their God was not strong enough to prevent such destruction, that their God was not powerful enough to prevent them from being scattered, that their God had forgotten them as a people. This passage in Jeremiah is likely a letter to exiles who had been in Babylon a short time, but thought, like I did going to seminary, Babylon would soon fall and that would pave the way for their return home. This particular group of exiles were living as a stable community and the writer and prophet seemed to know that they would remain in community in Babylon their whole lives long. He knew what my friend knew, that their longing for that old life over there would prevent them from living good, full lives in the present where they had been sent. Jeremiah's words to this group of exiles has a different tone, a different purpose than what Isaiah says. When Isaiah speaks to the exiles, Isaiah whispers comfort 
Do not fear. God is with you. You still belong to God. Take heart and know that God will fight for you to bring you home. That attitude would lead me to keep my bags packed at the door, ready to head out on a moment's notice. But Jeremiah has a different word. Jeremiah knows that some of these exiles will not see home again. The challenge of their lives is to shift their gaze to everything that is right before them. If they can do that, they will discover God in new places and in new ways, no temple required, as they allow Babylon to be their dwelling place. Of the many prophetic messages carried to the exiles, this word from Jeremiah assures that God is not lost to any old place. God is not stuck in any old life. God also exists in the ordinary places of today. So be in the place where you find yourself now and live there with great intention. Like Jeremiah, Jesus also knew that rooting to the present is the antidote for anxiety. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? But strive first for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When we name the goodness that is around us, name the ways we see God present, our focus shifts. We begin to see the details of a new story and a new home, and we can be sincerely grateful for this place, grateful for this time, grateful for this moment today. I mean this specifically and actively. When I am anxious, I have begun a practice, 2023 me, of naming trees as I drive. I will say it out loud like a nutter. Live oak, live oak, crepe myrtle, pine. I'm surprised by how often I say pine. Water oak, live oak, live oak, crepe myrtle, crepe myrtle, more pines. It's a simple practice that allows me to be here right here, nowhere else. Following the prophet's wisdom, we make a home for welcoming and feasting and being a neighbor. We plant a garden and spend some time with our hands in the soil. We find partners and have children. We slow down to the rhythm of life that having children demands. Then we watch them grow up and we release them into the world. We work together to seek the welfare of the city where God has sent us, and in seeking its welfare, we actually do find our own. There are seasons in life that may feel like exile. The unexpected death of a loved one, the unwanted demise of a marriage, a shocking medical diagnosis, a physical relocation, a crisis of faith, a season of depression and isolation. We know what it feels like to long, to long for something that no longer exists or is no longer ours to have. And we carry that longing with us. But we also need to remember that exile was very much wrapped up in the story of God, calling not just individuals, but a people the reminder to focus on the communal life around you requires exactly that, community. So this work of shifting our focus to the present and accepting the call to pursue the life before us is a call, yes, for us as individuals to practice, but it's also a call for us together as a faith to community to live out. 2013 me says, I've been thinking about you the brothers and sisters of the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church, for quite a while now. Though I do not yet know each one of you individually, snapshots of your story 
have been passed to me through people who know you and love you dearly. As I have thought and prayed and sat up at night thinking of you and this beautiful space and this amazing city, I have heard the words of Jeremiah. If I may be so bold as to make a few assumptions, I suspect that Israel's story of exile may feel a bit like your own at times. There were seasons in years past when this room was full, when the name of this place and its pastors were as much a presence on the avenue as the grand old trees bending across to reach the streetcars. Those were good, good days, and God was at work in them. You are not alone in these memories of sacred space and sacred time and what it used to be like. Every congregation has a slightly different story, but so many other beloved brick-and-mortar churches around the country also know that circumstances and times have changed. And there are empty pews everywhere this morning. Not just here, not just in New Orleans, but all across the country. It's tempting to look at what we lack. It's tempting for us to look at each other or for you to look at your pastor and ask, where are we? How do we get back to that place where we were? How do we get back to home? And these are important questions because they're rooted in love, deep love, great affection for the people who have shaped us and the things God has done through us. It's important to sit with these questions, to tell the stories of times that made us who we are, to acknowledge the truth also that something has changed forever. But like the exiles, we in the modern church must reach a point that we shift our gaze from fondly remembering that great life back there to this present life before us. Because God is here too. God is with us in this place at the beginning of a new story. And God still has great plans for our future. Jeremiah's words compel us to act today. And I believe that the call in the church of the 21st century is to shift our focus to the present, to the life and needs within and beyond our walls. As we move through the next decade, now finding us at the end of that decade, more and more of us will experience our salvation only in seeking the welfare of the cities and communities around us. Christianity Today spent much of the past two years, it was now 12 years ago, studying Christian communities around the United States committed to healing and vitality in their cities. They focused on people and churches who speak of seeking the welfare of the city as seeking God's shalom for all. And they defined shalom not simply as peace, but more robustly as comprehensive flourishing. They shared stories again and again of deep faith and of vibrant congregations whose primary focus was seeking the comprehensive flourishing of both stranger and friend until that shalom rippled through every part of the homes to which God had called them. The congregations who will thrive in the era to come will understand thriving in different ways. And they will each tell a story as unique as their church's context. The residential neighborhood church will find life differently than the one in the urban industrial setting. The small church in a farming community will come alive in a way far different than the small church in the middle of downtown. As I continue to remember you in prayer and imagine what your next story may be, I think about how well positioned St. Charles Avenue Baptist is in the city of New Orleans, the city known around the world for its joy and its celebration, its food and its music, its architecture and its people. People know that New Orleans is a place for everyone and anyone. More than Austin or Portland or Seattle, this city is known for welcoming the weird, the peculiar, the eccentric. And we just call him our next door neighbor. 
but there are complexities alongside the assets. New Orleans, like Richmond, Virginia, has its story in American history as a major player in the slave trade. That legacy weaves its way into modern day in subtle and powerful ways. This is a city still recovering 10 years ago, I would say, even now, from the memory and destruction of Hurricane Katrina, still dealing with the injustices that the storm and subsequent floods brought to the surface. Like much of, a South, there is a dis much of the South, there is a disparity here between rich and poor that lives its way out through schools and resources and public safety. So a faith community living into its present and future story here in this place must ask, what does seeking the welfare of the city look like for us? Where is God leading us next? Frederick Beekner, now the late Frederick Beekner, one of my great heroes in life and faith, calls this work of seeking the welfare of the city vocation. It's a different way of understanding calling. And he famously defines that life's work saying, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. As we people of faith, the great big churches and the ones barely eaten by move into a new phase of being church. We do not do so by losing our identities, forgetting or grasping at our past, or taking on a new way of being that is foreign to us but seems to have worked well somewhere else. We move into this new story by being most fully ourselves for the sake of the world. We pay attention to the goodness of God and the movement of God's spirit in daily life. We take on work and projects and causes and conversations at the intersection between our own deep gladness and the world's deep hunger. And in that sweet spot as individuals and as the body of Christ, we find our welfare and we find our home. May it be so. Amen.
acts of love. Zoom, I'm talking about the four o'clock death and dying class because I suspect you didn't hear any of that. It's four o'clock today. If you want to join us by Zoom, you can do it on the worship link again. This will be part two, hearing from the Neptune Society about cremation, um, as well as costs of funerals, and then also um, from a hospice representative. So please be here. And the handouts we did not have last week about the Five Wishes program are available today, so I can get those to you at four o'clock as well. This coming week will be quiet around the church office. Uh, the church office is closed much of this week. Olga is traveling home to Russia. Mark Boswell is already on vacation through next weekend. I will be out of the office from 613 to 20, which means Reverline, <laughs> Reverline, <laughs> we're gonna call you now, Reverline Caroline, Reverend Caroline Durham will be the pastor in charge for any emergencies that happen, as well as leading in worship and preaching next Sunday, the 18th. So you will want to be here, I know, to hear a good word from her. Thanksgiving in July is already beginning. You'll see boxes around the building marked Second Harvest Food Bank. So begin bringing in canned goods and non-perishable items so that in mid-July, we can pack all of those up and deliver them to Second Harvest Food Bank at the time of year when their supplies tend to be the lowest. So think of that every time you're making groceries in the weeks to come. I um, keep forgetting to mention this. I owe you an e-messenger and we'll make that happen before I go out of town. Together New Orleans has a delegates dinner coming up on the 15th, that is this week, that's this Thursday night at 6 p.m. in Lakeview at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. There is no cost for this meal, but I believe that you need to go to the TNO website, Together New Orleans website, just to register so they have a head count, and it would be wonderful to have some of you representing us. Yes? Oh, I didn't know. So now it's at First Grace, probably because the space at St. Paul's was too small. I, yeah. So First Grace, United Methodist, and that is Norman C. Francis and Canal. So please, some of you, I hope that you'll be able to go and represent us on Thursday night, hear about the work that Together New Orleans is doing and represent the St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church. Then get back to me or to Caroline or to Karen and let us know if you were able to attend. Two more looking ahead events. Um, the 23rd, not this Friday night, but next Friday night, we have a community cookout at 6 p.m. downstairs in our courtyard and we're gonna bring lawn games and I'm sure have music and just a fun Friday night together. Invite any of your friends and neighbors that you'd like to bring with you. And then Sunday, two weeks from now, the 25th at three in the afternoon, we have an amazing fundraiser with P Flag that is a, um, a, that is, uh, is a fundraiser for their scholarships for LGBTQIA youth. And we would love for all of you to come and help us to close out the month of pride with that fundraiser. And we'll certainly need people decorating, I'm looking for Danny, he's gone to the back, decorating and helping us with silent auction and welcoming people in and um, maybe selling some food and drink as well. So that's coming up at the end of this month. Are there any other announcements I've overlooked? And the Reimagine Retreat starts on Wednesday nights, the third Wednesday night of June. So not this Wednesday night, but next Wednesday night, the 21st, and then is again on the 28th. We're gonna take off the week for the 4th of July and we'll continue the second Wednesday of July. So that's Wednesday nights downstairs in our fellowship hall. There will be a meal. There is no cost for that attempt to attendance of that program. We would love for you to come for all three nights, but if you can only come for one or two, you will still hear important parts of that reimagine retreat led by the St. Charles Center for Faith and Action. And this is about reimagining the criminal legal sense system particularly through a restorative justice lens. Thank you, Reverline. All right, friends, as you go into this week, this hot, steamy week ahead, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.
Good morning.